Okay, so um, hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to our first show and tell from our Skillshare event that we had in September 2023, which feels like so long ago now. Um, it has actually been six months. Um, and in that time, Sarah from Gong has been working with Jubo from Forset. Um, to learn all about data visualization and how it can be used to tell stories from data released via FOI. So in a moment, Sarah is going to take us through what she's learnt um, and the stories and visualizations she's made and how it's going to change the work that she does going forwards while she is presenting. If you could all stay on mute, that would be really awesome. There will be time for questions afterwards. So over to you, Sarah. Um, so hi everyone, um, uh, my name is Sara, as some of you already know, and I am a project coordinator at Gong, which is a very vague title, but basically I'm uh, working on uh, several transparency uh, topics in Gong, uh, mainly dealing with um, foreign interference uh, in elections at the moment, because we have three elections this year. Uh, but together with my colleague Ser Sergei, who you also met, uh, I am also working on promoting freedom of information and um, open data. So let me show you um, what we produced, uh, uh, Gong, that is me, uh, with the help of mentors from Forset. Um, Jubo is here. Uh, and thank you, Jubo, for all the support. Uh, I think I, I am very happy with the results and I hope so are you. And let me, um, sorry, it's not, oh, okay. So a little bit of context first. Um, Gong was initially founded as a, an initiative of citizens monitoring elections, but eventually it grew into this interdisciplinary watchdog doing all sorts of activities and focusing on enhancing democratic processes and encouraging active participation from citizens. Uh, and as part of this um, uh, goal mission, uh, together with Code for Croatia, who is uh, a civic uh, activist, uh, uh, hackers type of organization, that's not so very active at the moment, uh, but they've helped us in 2015 when, when the platform kickstarted we created this API platform called uh, uh, What Do They Know in English, would be not a literal translation, but the translation that we use. Uh, but in the presentation, I will use the IPZ term. <laughs> uh, so it, it's, of course, powered by Alavet Delhi. Uh, about the project, um, so uh, the we, uh, we wanted to achieve uh, two main goals with this project. The first one would be uh, enhancing my uh, data visualization skills and storytelling skills. Um, and the second one was to promote using uh, IPZ as a platform for access to information among uh, mainly journalists and researchers, but also the general public, of course. So uh, at the beginning of the project, we had 1,600 IPZ users and 16 pro users. And within this uh, really short period of three months uh, since the publication of our first story, we've had some increase. And especially, uh, I would say that the, the pro version is usually this number uh, was very stagnant. So two additional pro users actually means something to us. Um, and um, the, the data visualization skills are something that I'm going to talk about in, uh, in the remaining part of the presentation. Um, so four areas uh, that we worked on were also like four stages of developing a specific story. Uh, this is data collection, data analysis, data storytelling, and data visualization. Uh, this set us, uh, two uh, last ones are very interconnected, so you will see that. I, I, I will dedicate a section to each of those. Um, uh, the data collection stage was basically brainstorming uh, 
topics that could be turned into a relevant story. And there were over a dozen ideas that we then narrowed down. Uh, and these are the topics that we uh, chose. Uh, and uh, our main source was IPZ. So we sent uh, a huge number of requests using IPZ Pro. Um, I used my personal account to test out um, how easy it was to get uh, the information. So there were some challenges, but for example, I'm very happy with the fact that our local referendum story, which entailed 575 uh, requests uh, that were sent, the one request was sent to that many uh, recipients, uh, received actually 525 responses, which is way more than we expected. Uh, but yes, some of the challenges were definitely um, information officers not understanding exactly what the law entails. For example, sometimes I would be asked to give my personal identification number, which is not uh, a condition that they're allowed to set. Um, also, we have an ongoing complaint regarding the second topic, the special advisors where uh, one of the ministries refused to provide information on special advisors, uh, stating uh, that it was against GDPR, which is very strange for us. So we will see what the information commissioner will decide. Uh, the next stage was data analysis. Uh, after data collection, it took some time to uh, see which data sets were uh, good, and this required organizing data in Excel. For me, that was the easiest uh, uh, way to do it. Um, they were quite chaotic, but they helped uh, to compare data from various uh, sources. And uh, the main thing was finding an angle to read uh, the data from the perspective of what we want to advocate, what the message. Uh, that Gong wants to communicate was. And uh, it was pretty good, but some of the topics were not an option because the data was very, um, not very good, basically. So uh, the, the main stage was actually data storing and the visualization. These are the three topics that we chose. Um, you will receive uh, this presentation with links to articles if you're interested in, in actually reading them. Uh, but uh, basically, local referendums was the first article, uh, which was published in December. Then uh, we had special advisors in the government, uh, also an article with charts. And uh, the third one was not yet published because it's meant to be used in a campaign that uh, we will be doing. Uh, in late spring, so uh, you will see it, but it's not publicly available yet. And the tools used for visualizations were Canva and Flourish mostly. Uh, Canva is something I was familiar with uh, because I do a lot of uh, social media visuals for the organization, but Flourish was completely new to me, so I had to learn how to use it. And uh, I'm very happy I did it because it's actually very easy to use and similar to Canva. Uh, this is what um, it looks like when you enter the application and you can uh, choose really huge numbers of different types of charts and simply upload your data or, or copy it. It's very intuitive. I would say you can make maps, all sorts of things. So uh, in, the, in each of the three stories, we included a, a call to action. The first two stories, since they were articles, uh, we used this call to action basically to uh, encourage people to use IPJ, IPZ and especially uh, the pro version, which is free and it uh, allows uh, users to send uh, requests to multiple addresses and to keep it a secret for a while if there are journalists uh, who don't want people to know that they're working on a certain topic. And here is the, uh, the first story. Uh, usually uh, our point is already in the headline, like here uh, we were criticizing uh, the current uh, referendum 
regulation, which is, in our opinion, too strict. It's one of the strictest, actually, when it comes to local referendums, one of the strictest uh, laws in uh, the European Union. And this is the data that we initially asked for. So the number of local referendums, which uh, took place, uh, the topics that were decided on, outcomes, and also in case they had the information, which uh, they didn't necessarily have, uh, was the number of initiatives that were, were submitted to the representative, uh, representative body, but in the end were not uh, valid for some reason. So no referendum took place. Uh, we expected uh, way less than what we got. So a total of 47 referendums uh, happened, actually. And there's no national body that uh, keeps track of uh, these referendums. Uh, so this is the first time that somebody actually collected data from the entire country. And we were really surprised to see that 47 of them uh, happened. And of course, there were there were a lot more initiatives, but we uh, have knowledge of uh, only 13. Uh, what was interesting is uh, that a huge number of them wasn't legally valid. The decisions weren't legally valid, and this is what we were able to criticize, uh, stating that uh, if uh, the law was different, uh, a lot of them would have been actually the majority of them would have been legally valid and that would um, encourage local democracy more. Uh, this is the map. So um, I think this was a pretty easy way to show uh, where the referendums took place. Uh, also, it's interesting that this county here, Mejimoria County, had uh, a pretty big concentration of local referendums, and uh, a lot of them were successful, uh, which is uh, something that I will get back to uh, later. But uh, this is the visualization that shows uh, current legislation. So, for example, less people than this, I mean, a um, uh, smaller percentage, 43%, decided on whether to enter the European Union. But some uh, smaller local issues, but, and this is also something that we covered in the articles, like what topics were uh, most common. Um, the, in those cases, you have to have over uh, half, half of the registered voters. Uh, the proposed legislation is a bit better. This is uh, the middle one. and. Um, the, the issue with this, we would be happy with this solution as well. Uh, but uh, it, the draft that appeared in 2021 is still, it, nobody knows what's going on, basically. <laughs> it, it's a lot of years for a law to be adopted. Um, and this is Gong's recommendation. So 25% plus, uh, plus one of all registered voters. Okay, so Mejimoria County, this is uh, their local news portal. And uh, of course, their headline is Mejimoria County had the most local referendums. It's, it wasn't very interesting uh, to maybe some national uh, media outlets, but it was interesting, interesting to a local one that could say this. And, and uh, I think it's cool that they used uh, this visualization for their uh, cover photo because you can see clearly uh, how, how well they were doing, right? Most of them were successful uh, compared to some other counties that were, for example, uh, the city of Zagreb didn't have any, the capital didn't have any local government. Okay, the second story uh, was the most interesting one to the media because there was a scandal. We did not expect this, but uh, when we started collecting data, we were interested in uh, uh, special advisors, what their names were, uh, what they were in charge of, and uh, what fees they were receiving, because we knew that um, they weren't uh, subject to uh, legislation on the conflict of interest. 
And we thought this was problematic. They were uh, external advisors, which are um, not exactly employees, but they still have a lot of influence. And they also, uh, in some cases, receive really huge fees. So uh, this is what we started with. But then in December, this uh, guy here on the photo uh, was revealed for uh, using public funds to try to buy a favorable media treatment for the minister and also grab some of the money for himself, which is when we discovered that there were two types of advisors because when we uh, asked the Ministry of Economy how many advisors they had, they said zero. And then this guy was a special advisor, so it was kind of weird for us. And we realized there were two laws uh, that used the same term for two different functions. Um, uh, according to the Government Act, you have these advisors that most of us know about. Uh, the external advisors uh, who may or may not receive financial compensation. And then you have special advisors, according to the State Administration Act, who are employees, actually. And, but none of them uh, are subject to the Conflict of Interest Prevention Act, which is also interesting to us. Okay, so yeah, these are, these are, this is the first kind advisor and you can see the Ministry of the Economy has zero. Now they have zero in total because the guy was fired, obviously, along with the minister. Um, uh, here we use a simple pie chart to show that uh, most of the advisors were receiving around 600 uh, uh, euros. That is between four, 400 and 800. So let's say 600 in average, uh, but some of them received no fees for uh, a very large scope of uh, topics they were covering, which was strange. And some of them received uh, a huge amount, like, uh, for example, 1,200, uh, 1,200 uh, euros. Um, but the criteria for uh, determining this is kind of unclear. We don't, we don't know based on what. Uh, this, this is the discretion of the minister, basically, to decide how much somebody receives. And this is the nationwide, some of the nationwide media outlets uh, that shared our story. But they had a different angle, you know. Uh, you can't read this, but basically, it says uh, comfy chairs, uh, look at how well uh, special advisors are doing. Uh, what they also found interesting was that the prime minister's advisor, who worked for him for free, uh, was also receiving highest compensation in a ministry. And so he was like a double the special advisor. Uh, whereas for us, focus was on regulating conflict of interest. And the third story, um, which we didn't publish, and it wasn't based on uh, ATI requests, uh, was uh, our Vote 16 campaign. Uh, and here, uh, it, it looks easy because it's just one image, but actually it was a lot of work. <laughs> uh, first of all, to find any data on this topic uh, that could support uh, um, our argumentation, um, but basically uh, what we wanted to show is that young people see voting as uh, uh, the most efficient political action, uh, yet this is denied to uh, a, a large portion of them. And there really aren't, we have a publication on this topic where you can see that uh, there's no research to show that they don't have enough cognitive abilities or that maybe even knowledge isn't the best uh, criteria for excluding them. But this was very difficult to include in an infographic. So what we focused on was young people want to vote. Um, in some uh, countries in the European Union, they can, like Germany, Austria, Belgium, and Malta. Uh, the, the age limit is 16. In Hungary, if you're married, 
you can vote at 16. Uh, and in Greece, you can vote at 17. So it's not really equal treatment. Uh, and they all vote at the same elections, the EU elections. Um, and we included this uh, table to show that uh, uh, these uh, countries aren't doing too bad regarding democracy index score. Uh, this could maybe be criticized because in, in some areas, these countries aren't doing all that well. But um, generally, when we look at democratic processes, uh, this is still uh, a lot better than Croatia based on the democracy index score. This is voter turnout in Austria, also um, not showing like a huge jump or anything, but it shows that there's no negative impact of lowering the voting age, uh, given that they've had uh, the lower uh, limits for the longest of all countries. And um, yeah, in the end, uh, we wanted to show that young people feel excluded. And uh, especially in Croatia, where the population is really aging, um, they're in danger of um, becoming completely ignored, basically, as a, a group. So we uh, also included uh, a call to action at the bottom, which says sign the vote 16 petition, and this can go to anyone, anyone can sign it. So this will be probably shared on social media. Uh, we plan to maybe simplify it for uh, 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 publishing to make it into social media cards. Um, and maybe, maybe the call to action will be altered also, depending on what we decide to do generally. But yes, this is it from me and thank you for your attention if you have any questions please feel free thank you so much sarah okay i have a question for you sarah um i was going to just ask you how do you think uh things have changed for you like what what has this learning process meant for the work that you're doing um, for me, it has meant a lot because I'm expected to do a lot of uh, such uh, content in the future. Uh, and especially because I have no experience in data visualization. I, I, I did do graphic design, you know, amateur graphic design for the organization. And, and I loved it, but I realized that data visualization is really important if you want to uh, support messages that are, especially if you want to change legislation, if you want to uh, change people's minds about some things that are really uh, traditionally uh, predominant. Uh, so I think uh, it was just great <laughs> to, to you know, get the basis to to continue building those skills because I don't think three months is really enough to uh, actually you know become a pro like uh, for said <laughs> team. Uh, but I, I I know where to start. I have a lot of uh, resources that they shared with me uh, to use in the future to learn more about which graphs are uh, better to use. Uh, for which type of data and so on. So this is great. Go ahead, Miss. Hey, you need to unmute yourself, lovely. Uh, classic okay. rookie mistake there. <laughs> Obviously my first time on Zoom. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask about the process of learning from Forset. Like, did you have regular meetups? Were they really involved with, like, helping you choose subject matter, or did that come more from your side and they just helped with the um, visualization? Uh, uh, first of all. We had a lot of meetings. Yes, I, I completely forgot to mention that. So we would meet uh, regularly uh, for each of the three topics. Uh, and also uh, when the work was uh, 
really in an advanced stage. Uh, we would work in a Google document together and leave comments and so on. Um, but uh, your second question, uh, can you just rem remind me what the second question was? Yeah, so it was about how how much did the subject matter come from Gong oh, or did yeah, Forset yeah. feed into that? Okay, so uh, uh, Forset uh, didn't really have uh, enough insight into the Croatian context, which is, uh, of course, normal and expected. Uh, and I think they did great compared, uh, considering that um, uh, they had to learn about this whole new legal system and, you know, a uh, different uh, way of functioning. Uh, and I, I feel like there wasn't any issue with the communication there. Uh, but most of the suggestions uh, to choose topics and why they were important did come from uh, me and uh, from my team, because I discussed it within uh, Gong before we started working on something. Uh, so, yeah, but definitely when I wasn't sure, for example, if the third topic was kind of tricky, choosing it. Uh, so I uh, definitely relied on their advice on whether to pursue the topic at all, whether it was, uh, whether it made sense, considering that there's not much data on it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I think it's probably just worth saying that any one of those topics would translate really well to the UK context. And I don't know whether that's true of every country, but certainly it might be sparking some ideas for some of the UK based people here. Thank you. Go ahead, Gareth. Yeah, I mean, as everyone said, that was uh, like really, really interesting. And I don't think there's uh, any fear of uh, those graphics feeling amateur at all. They're so much better than I could do. Um, I was wondering, like, if I sort of interpreted it right, you know, like there's a mix of FOI data and other data, you know, like put together, right? So, like, did you find there any significant differences or difficulties or you know, particular things you had to think about when convert or, you know, doing something with the FOI data as opposed to some of the other data you had? Like, was there anything particularly unique about that or um, was it just kind of all similar? Uh, actually, uh, it was, I think, for me, easier to work with the FOI data because I knew exactly uh, what I wanted to get from uh, the institutions that I contacted. Uh, and uh, it was for the first two topics, really, uh, it, it went really well getting the information. And I was surprised, especially for the local referendums, where uh, there are some really, really small places where you don't even know if they have an information uh, officer to help you. Uh, so the fact that we received so many replies was great. And most of them were because the questions were really straightforward, we mostly got straightforward answers. Whereas for the third topic, I had to go through a lot and lot of reports. Um, and um, a, a lot of the data was maybe uh, clashing. Like I would find something that I thought was a really great argument. And then I, I would find some other data that would maybe discourage me from using that. The, for that special uh, infographic. So, so yeah, actually, FY data, it's, it's so easy to just, you know, ask a question and get your answer. Yeah. Maybe not in all countries by the looks of it. <laughs> uh, no, it, it also depends on the topic. Local referendums is a very neutral topic. So I see Laurent was, <laughs> was uh, surprised. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it's a neutral, politically neutral topic. The special advisors, as I mentioned, we have a complaint going on. Before that, uh, it, uh, was, it, it took some time to get information on that because they have reasons to not disclose it. Probably. Hmm. Like, that's super interesting to hear. And, like, did you, 
like did you or what what thinking or did you put thinking into like how to phrase the questions up front such that you would get this nice and clean data and like you know what kind of things were you thinking about when you were putting those questions together uh, yeah, I, I mean, the best question is a yes or no question. <laughs> uh, all, all the others is those topics that we excluded from uh, the selection uh, later in the process that we did try to get data on, but didn't work out. Uh, the reason was because uh, we were asking for uh, a bit more complex uh, things like uh, uh, how how much of the um, uh, local budget is reserved for uh, supporting civic education and how do they do it? So it, it could be like um, from just saying we support civic education, but, you know, letting schools do it by themselves to uh, actually providing some money to, and creating their own textbooks for civic education. There are a lot of things that they could include, and, and sometimes they would write two pages uh, in their response uh, that would would essentially uh, mean that they support it, but not really, because nothing really special is being done about it. So, yeah, that that was a bit more difficult to read. Amazing. I think we've probably got time for like one or two more questions. If anyone who hasn't asked one yet has a question at all. Long, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks for sharing all of this. Um, I, I guess I was just like kind of giggling at your last answer because uh, I guess from our perspective, it's just, just so hard to get anything. Did you, you mentioned in your presentation that you had like a number of, like a bigger number of topics initially. Uh, and then you sort of narrow down to uh, those three, uh, those three ones. Did you do that because, like, before you asked the questions, or did you ask questions about everything and then kind of pick the ones that you actually managed to get information about? Uh, so, sorry, I'm not uh, sure I understand. You know, um, yeah. Basically, did you did you narrow down the number of questions, the number of specific topics that you worked on um, before or after asking questions, uh, sending FOI requests about them? Uh, both, actually. So okay. at the beginning, we had 10 topics. And then we uh, decided uh, which of those were best suited for FOI requests. Mm -hmm. Then we sent those requests on five topics. And then ah, okay. when we got the answers. Um, a lot of them were not very good, and if it, and since there were so many recipients, we didn't have enough time to, you know, go uh, grab the rest of the information, uh, you know, uh, and remind them to reply and so on. So then we chose the best data sets, basically. Okay, okay. Do, do you think there would be a way to build some data visualization about the other two where yeah, you're missing data? Maybe that's a question for Drugo as well. I don't know. Um, just as, a, as an aside, I guess the reason I'm asking for this is that we see a lot of these cases where you know we ask a lot of questions and basically we don't have information and we're trying to find ways to show that there is no information. And it's kind of difficult because outside of saying, you know, hey, 80 percent of people don't reply, there's, there's, it's not really like a very exciting way of saying things. Um, some kind of yeah, kind of fishing for ideas here, I guess. Uh, well, I think it's a great topic to, to show how well or how badly uh, the FOI system in your country is working. So you, so it can actually be a separate topic, not the topic that you chose, but for example, uh, visualizing how uh, certain topics are maybe doing better with, uh, re with receiving replies, whereas some other topics aren't, or certain bot, you know, showing uh, which public bodies are most responsive, that type of thing. I think it's a, a great way to uh, put pressure on institutions to uh, 
uh, respect the law. <laughs> um i think you can also maybe not leverage but use the fact that data are now and not data that is not available can be a story of your visualization we usually have this issue in central asian countries we have mentorship programs there for journalists but they are not able to get public information on many different uh, topics so they build story on the fact that, okay, there is this issue, gender violence, for example. There are some cases that we know about that is happening in country, but we do not have data so that we can know what exactly is the problem, how wide is it. So they build their concept on the fact that we need data and there is no data about such an important issue. So you can kind of uh, use that point as a central point in this story, I think. Yeah, that's very much in line with uh, with what we are building at the moment. Uh, we'll have some stuff to share like soon, hopefully, in along those lines. But yeah. Anyway, thanks for sharing that. That's uh, helpful. I like the idea of looking at it per topic. It's actually a, an angle we haven't taken yet. Amazing, thank you. Are there any other questions before we finish up? Gareth, go ahead. I was wondering what the experience was like from your end, Jubo. Like, what, what did you sort of learn from, you know, going through this and explaining or, you know, like, you know, working with someone else and like, you know, what what could we learn from that as well as just, you know, the data visualization? Uh, the first uh, takeaway for us was that it's not very often to see three stories produced within uh, such a short time and Sarah was so quick and flexible and it was such a great experience for us. What we learned once again is that it's always better to request data, large data, that is split into different components, sorted from the public institution so that it's easier to work with data and get many findings. So great thing about FOI is that you can leverage your position. There's a bunch of data available online, but they are already sorted in a way that their owner wanted to sort. With FOI, you can leverage this opportunity and ask them to sort it in a way that you want to have it in your story, in a problem that you are addressing. So it's, it's always great to have large data sets split into different parts. We also saw it that Canva might be very uh, simple and popular that everybody has heard of it, but it's such a great tool to get on board with visualization and Sarah demonstrated it. And also uh, Canva and Flourish merged their business about one year ago and Canva has gotten really advanced with data visualization features so it's, it's a great tool to start visualization. Uh, the most important thing is to choose the right format charts and graphs that can represent your findings. And also it's important not to choose format that will that can lie and manipulate findings. And there are a bunch of resources available uh, to get, get on board with it. And it was also a learning experience for us that Okay, we did not know about these topics that Sarah suggested, but the general framework can be applied to, I guess, many different countries. Framework where you request data, uh, then you analyze data, uh, work on a concept note on how to build a story, and then build a story that can be published in online media, in social media, so this general and really simple framework, I think, can be applied to, I don't know, maybe uh, all countries within, within this network. And it was a pleasure to see impact in Croatia for it. So yeah, it was such a great experience and a big, big thanks for, for Sarah, to Sarah for it. Well, thank you both for participating and like being willing to jump in on, on doing this. It's been amazing to watch what's happened um and we're really 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 proud of both of you and really happy um 
so yeah thank you Sarah for sharing everything that you've learned um before we go just gonna give you a quick reminder <laughs> that we'd love to see you guys at Tic Tech if you can make it um it is in London on June 12th and 13th um I'm hoping that people can come because I'd really, really love to do an in-person meetup on the 14th of June for everyone in the ATI network, just so that we can actually get together in person. Um, so I've sent a discount code for the tickets, um, but if the amount still feels like it's too much for your organization, then do let me know and I'll see if I can get extra discount from Gemma. Um, and also if you need support with travel, let us know we don't have a huge amount of money to do that but we will have a look around we're looking for sponsors at the moment so we can we'll see what we can do we've got a little bit of time um so yeah if there's travel grant issues and you need help with that kind of thing just let us know um and then uh we've got another meeting on april 24th for a global group of people and Lisette is going to be presenting so she's going to be talking us through her journey setting up spoon so i'm hoping that you guys will also be able to come to that um and that is all from me thank you so much everyone for coming along thank you for presenting sarah thank you sarah and duo for taking part in the mentorship i'm just very happy to be a part of this <laughs> thank you so much Jen. thank you for this opportunity it was really really great Right. Yes, same here. Bye.